Good morning. Great to see you this morning. And I don't know, what's up with starting school in the middle of August these days? Isn't that kind of bizarre? Used to be we got three months off uh, back when we were uh, chiseling our homework on stone tablets, but I don't know what's going on today. But summer's getting shorter and the kids are back in school. So here we are, off and running for another year. And I'd encourage you to come out on Wednesday nights as we continue our study in the book of 1 Samuel. Last Wednesday night was a tough and ugly chapter filled with death and destruction and all those other things that we know are associated with disobedience. And we looked at the death of the sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas for defiling the practices at the temple and fleecing basically the children of Israel. But this Wednesday, we're going to go into another chapter that reminds us of the power of God over all idols. As we see the Ark of the Covenant placed in a temple next to a God named Dagon of the Philistines. And uh, we'll find some interesting interaction between uh, what happens there and God making his presence known. So come on out if you want to read ahead. First Samuel 5 will be our chapter. So here we go. Open your Bibles this morning to Acts chapter 13. Acts 13, 1 to 12 will be our text this morning. Now, last week, we noted that the common experiences and practices of the church are going to remain unchanged throughout the duration of church history. And we noted that the church is always going to be persecuted. We noted that the church should always be in prayer. And we noted that the church will always experience the power of God as they are enabled by his spirit. Now, from the ESV, 1 Corinthians 4.20 says, For the kingdom of God does not consist in what? Talk. Your translation, the new uh, King James will read in word, but it's rightfully translated also as talk. The kingdom of God does not consist in talk, but in what? In power. In other words, what we believe, what we have in the written word of God is not unsubstantiated words like the religions of the world, but our faith is based on fact and infallible proofs of the deity of Jesus. Now we know this, that Jesus was God in human form flesh, the foretold one of Isaiah 714 and 9 also, because he manifested divine power when he walked on the earth. He resurrected from the dead after he was wrongfully accused and murdered, and he ascended back into heaven in front of eyewitnesses who watched him be received in the clouds, and these witnesses later gave testimony of all that they saw and heard, thus validating Jesus' death, resurrection, and ascension as the only valid means that a man or woman's soul can be saved. Somebody say... Now, we also recognize that there's going to be seasons of history where persecution seems to be greater and lesser at various times. And there are times where the church is going to enjoy a relative peace, so to speak. The same is true of various places around the world. We as a country have been blessed to live in a season, if you will, where the church has enjoyed a near absence of any physical persecution for our faith since the birth of our nation. Now, things are changing. The climate is changing in the attitude of non-believers toward the church in these last days. Has anybody noticed that? We're seeing more and more stories about the persecution of Christians just because they hold to the biblical doctrines and precepts that are recorded and commanded in God's word. Now, we also have noted in recent weeks that the progression that Jesus introduced in Acts 1-8 about the receiving of power to be witnesses, and then there was a geographic series of markers given, if you will. Once the believers were baptized, they would first be witnesses in Jerusalem. We read that in earlier chapters, five, uh, four and five, and then in Judea and Samaria, beginning with Cornelius and the church at Syrian Antioch, we saw that after the spread to these uh, this region of Israel, it began to make its way beyond the borders 
and begin its journey to the ends of the earth. Now, our chapter is often noted by many as a transitional chapter, as from this point on, the focus of Acts primarily is reaching the Gentile world. Now, the gospel's journey to the ends of the earth actually began, began rather, in chapter 11. But we need to make a critical point before we get into our text any deeper in this transition in the book of Acts. Before the efforts could begin in earnest to reach the Gentile world, the Lord established a church in Syrian Antioch, a, a, an assembly of believers in a pagan territory as kind of a base of operations for reaching out to the ends of the earth. Now, one noteworthy point that we need to direct or that will help direct our approach to these verses is the role of the Holy Spirit in the birth of the church at Jerusalem and the role of the Holy Spirit in the birth of the global missions movement that started in Syrian Antioch. Now, we need to recognize also there is one church. Amen? Amen. There is one church and there is one kind of Christian. And everyone that is truly a Christian is a born-again Christian. Now, people try and put labels on it, but the fact is, Jesus said you must be born again. If you're not born again, Jesus said, say Jesus said, you are not going to heaven and therefore you are not part of the one church that spans the globe and the whole of the age of church history. So with that in mind, knowing there is one church, we note also that there is one spirit, one God who is within us all, as Paul said in the book of Ephesians. So as we note the role of the Holy Spirit in initiating and directing the missions movement that continues to this day that began in Jerusalem, spread to Judea and Samaria and began its journey through Syrian Antioch to the uttermost parts of the earth and reaching the Gentiles. We need to understand what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 1, 1 to 3, that he being called and to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the what? The will of God. And Sosthenes, our brother, to the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all who in every place call on the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, both their Lord and ours, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. The church of God, the saints of God, in every place and time are people who call on the name of of the Lord Jesus, be they Jew or Gentile. Now listen, there are different types of churches. There's no question about that. But true churches are all filled or predominantly filled, hopefully with born again believers. There are different styles of worship. Hello? There are different styles of worship. There are different orders of service in various churches, but there is still only one church. And every church should practice and teach the principal doctrines and precepts of the word of God. Amen. Amen? Yes. Including our focus today and our title as well, which is walking in the spirit. Our title today is Walking in the Spirit. Now, is this something that Christians ought to practice? Yes. Absolutely, it's a biblical doctrine. Now, therefore, when we think of walking in the Spirit, our minds often gravitate to verses like Galatians 5.16, where Paul says, I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And yes, that is an enabling capacity of walking in the Spirit and the manifestation of the Spirit within us, not fulfilling the lust of the flesh. And walking in the Spirit includes being directed away from the things that our flesh naturally gravitates to or even lust after. Remember, the word lust means to long for forbidden things. But walking in the Spirit is not limited to just not fulfilling or pursuing the lust of the flesh. And we're going to find the Holy Spirit this morning 
mentioned four times in our dozen verses. And what we're going to see is that the Holy Spirit said, then the Holy Spirit sent, and then we'll find the Holy Spirit filled. Now, this is what walking in the Spirit looks like. Today, the Holy Spirit is still speaking. He is still sending. He is still filling and empowering. And he's doing so for the purpose of spreading the gospel to the ends of the earth and bringing glory to the Father through the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's jump in and see what walking in the Spirit looked like in Acts so we can understand what it looks like at CCT and other churches around the world. Amen? Amen. So would you stand and read with me, please? Acts chapter 13, verses 1 through 12, as we learn of walking in the Spirit. Acts 13, 1. Now in the church that was at Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manaen, who had been brought up with Herod, the Tetrarch, and Saul. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then, having fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they sent them away. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. And when they had arrived in Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. They also had John as their assistant. Now, when they had gone through the island to Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bar-Jesus, who was with the proconsul Sergius Paulus, an intelligent man. This man called for Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. But Elimus the sorcerer, for so his name is translated, withstood them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. Then Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, O full of all deceit and all fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, will you not cease perverting the straight ways of the Lord? And now indeed the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you shall be blind, not seeing the sun for a time. And immediately a dark mist fell on him, and he went around seeking someone to lead him by the hand. Then the proconsul believed when he saw what had been done, being astonished at the teaching of the Lord. And Father, again, we're grateful for your word. We pray, God, that it would do what it was called to do according to your word. And that is, as we'll see and be reminded this morning, equip the saints for the work of ministry. So, Lord, we know that the work of ministry also requires the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus, you said, without you we can do nothing. So you sent the third member of the triune Godhead to us to dwell within us, to guide us and order our steps in accordance with your word. So teach us what it means, we pray this morning, to walk in the Spirit. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Now, you note takers will have as a heading of all three of our observations, walking in the spirit, our title. Now, our first observation concerning walking in the spirit comes from verses one through five, where we're told the church at Antioch had within them some prophets and teachers. Now, the word certain means also some. It can be translated as some. It wasn't meant to uh, specify anything beyond the names that are mentioned. Now that reminds us of Ephesians 4, 11 and 12, where we're told that he, Jesus himself, gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Now again, the he is Jesus, the recipients of his giving, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, is the body of Christ, which is a synonym for the church. And the purpose is for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry by edifying. And that word in this context means to promote Christian growth. That's the purpose of God calling some and gathering us all together to be taught 
the word of God. Now we see this very thing happening in Syrian Antioch, the first church in Gentile territory. And we are introduced to a group of men called according to God's purposes with the gift of teaching and promoting Christian growth in the church. And one of the things we need to observe is a point we made some weeks back. This is a wonderfully interracial group that the Lord called to this church. The list starts with Barnabas, a Cypriot. He was a native of Cyprus, followed by a man named Simeon. And we're told his name also is Niger, which is a Latin word for black. Obviously, he was a black man. And then another Gentile named Lucius, who was from Cyrene, which is in North Africa, may also have been a black man. Some would say uh, uh, something interesting about him. We'll mention in a second. But we also note that there was one who was named Manaean who rather interestingly, his name doesn't have any uh, derivation associated with it, but it means comforter. Well, we don't know what type of ethnicity he had, but it's likely he was either a Roman or an Idumean since he served in Herod's house. And then add to that, there was Saul, a Jew. Now, this Simon or Simeon, some believe to be the one who was compelled to carry the cross of Jesus Christ after he collapsed under the weight of it having huge and significant blood loss after being severely beaten. But no matter who he is, he is one who is called to this position of teaching the church at Syrian Antioch. Now, this is an interesting group. To me, as I read through, I thought it almost sounds like a lead in to a joke. A Cypriot, two Africans, a Roman and a Jew walk into a church. And then who knows what happens after that, but we'll see some interesting things. Now, this is how God designed the church. The fact is we are not to be separated by skin tone or ethnicity. The church is to reflect exactly what we see presented here in the scripture. Now, this group of men ministered to the Lord and they fasted. And in the midst of this ministry and fasting and prayer, obviously, the Holy Spirit said, appoint or set apart Saul and Barnabas for the work with which I have called them to or for which I've called them to. Now, after this group of men were spoken to by the Holy Spirit, they prayed and fasted. And after prayer and fasting, they then laid hands on Saul and Barnabas and sent them on their way. Now, verse four tells us that they went to the local port of Seleucia, then sailed the 130 miles to Cyprus and finally arrived in the city of Salamis and preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. And they has as their roadie, if you will, John Mark. He was their assistant. So here's the first thing we need to ask concerning walking in the spirit. If the Holy Spirit said, separate, set apart Barnabas and Saul for the work I've called them to, what was there to fast and pray about? Why would these leaders of the church, why would these who were called, why were these who were familiar with interacting with the Holy Spirit and teaching the word of God after they had collectively received a word from the Holy Spirit, why would they fast and pray? Well, they would fast and pray for the same reason you and I would fast and pray. Have you ever been unsure that it was God that spoke to you or not? Have you ever needed confirmation that it was indeed the Lord when there was that Holy Spirit nudge on your heart and it was a major decision? It was something such as this that would change or shake up the structure of this infant church. So they sought the Lord. They prayed and they fasted and the Holy Spirit spoke. Now, we don't know initially how they all received the message from God that these two men were to be set apart. It's likely one of the men with the gift of prophecy mentioned here was the one who spoke the word and it was confirmed in the hearts of the hearers. But we also need to note of what Peter said in 2 Peter 1, 19 to 21. He wrote, we, and so we have the prophetic word, what? Confirmed which you do well to heed is a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your heart. Knowing this first, 
that no prophecy, say no prophecy, no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation, for prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Now, Peter's comments are obviously addressing the written word of God, but he says those words even were to be confirmed. We had them confirmed either through elsewhere in Scripture or by their fulfillment. So thus, if the written word of God needed to be confirmed, how much more the spoken words by the Holy Spirit, the guiding, the sending, and the filling, how much more do we need to understand whether or not it was the Lord? Now, that tells us that while God alone did the commissioning, he alone chose who was to be sent. He did it through the church. He did it through the laying on of hands. And the laying on of hands symbolically creates a, an, an association between the spirit who was doing the sending and the church who would also send the ones out. Now, just as in the Old Testament, the offerer placed his hands on the sacrifice, creating an identification with it, that it was representing him or all of the nation of Israel when the scapegoat would be released in the wilderness symbolically carrying away their sins. So now we have the assembled church of Antioch laying their hands on two ambassadors for Christ. They were saying in effect, brothers, we are with you in this great enterprise. As you go, we go. As you are part of us, we are part of you. And Barnabas and Saul left on their journey with full identification and support of the church. Now, this all leads to one word of instruction and caution for us all. As is true with most things that pertain to biblical doctrine, doctrines, precepts, and practices of the faith, we not only need to know what they are, we also need to know what they are not, And that will be our first observation. Listen this morning. Walking in the Spirit is not a life independent of church structure or accountability. Walking in the Spirit is not a life independent of church structure or accountability. Now, what the Holy Spirit said was met with fasting and prayer. And thus it was conf confirmed, and then the two men were sent by the Spirit and by the church. Now, the reason this is important is there are many today who say they don't need to go to church, or they don't need to sit under a pastor's teaching because they are led by the Spirit. You can't back that position up biblically. The Bible says, go to church. Read Hebrews 10, 25. Do not forsake the assembling together with other believers, as is the custom, a cust, uh, custom of some, I should say. But it goes on to say, as you see the day approaching, or the last days, be together all the more. We're going to need each other all the more. And listen, when someone is leading or says they're being led away from the structure of the church, listen, God is not going to lead in that direction. And therefore, they're listening to a voice that is not of the Lord. Now think about this. In Acts 14, 26 and 27, we're told from there, they sailed Barnabas and Saul to Antioch, where they had been commended to the grace of God for the work which they had what? Completed. Now when they had come and gathered the church together, they reported all that God had done with them and that he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. Now listen, even Saul and Barnabas gave an account to the church they were a part of of what they collectively were led to do by the Spirit. Some sent, some went, but all received confirmation from the Lord that this was his will. Now listen, here's also a, a word of balance in this. The church does not have the right or responsibility to monitor and govern every step that every Christian takes, like some teach in the shepherding movement. That's not what we're talking about. 
But what we are talking about is being careful because walking in the spirit does not mean you are independent of a church body and you just do whatever it is that's on your heart or mind. We have an accountability and a responsibility to a church body that we share as each part does its share. The church is not the micromanager of all the sheep or the saints. However, all the sheep and all the saints are to pull at the same oars and work collectively together. And that's where you say, amen. amen. Now let's pick it up in six through eight. We're told now when they had gone through the island to Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bar-Jesus, who was with the proconsul Sergius Paulus, an intelligent man. This man called for Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of the Lord. But Elimus the sorcerer, for so his name is translated, withstood them seeking to turn the proconsul away from what? The truth. So that's what he was hearing from Barnabas and Saul. Now, having traveled east to west across Cyprus from Seleucia to Paphos, the capital of the island, the two missionaries then encountered two men. One was the Roman governor, Sergius Paulus, who uh, Luke describes as being an intelligent man, meaning that he was a man of understanding. And the other was called Bar-Jesus, who was a false prophet or sorcerer. Now, it seems likely and maybe even evident that Sergius Paulus was weary of the materialism and idolatry of the island, for Cyprus was referred to as Marcaria, not Macarena, but Marcaria, which means the Happy Isle. It was known for its perfect climate and its resources being in abundance. Now, the proconsul, being an intelligent man, likely saw the emptiness of the supposed good life that, and was looking for something higher, something more genuine, which would account for the presence of the wizard Elimus. Sergius Paulus had been consulting him for help, and he was under his sway, so to speak, yet he clearly saw the emptiness of the false teaching and wanted to hear from Saul and Barnabas the word of God. Now, this man, Bar-Jesus, we're told, meaning son of Jesus or even son of salvation, had such a name because he probably claimed to be a spiritual descendant of Jesus and thus an heir to his magical powers, so to speak. The sorcerer was claiming to know the way of salvation. Now, Elimus, which is an Arabic word that means skillful one, and no doubt he was skillful at deception. He was a man of immense power, having influence even over the ruler of Cyprus. Now, in Luke 21, 8, we're told, and he said, Jesus speaking, take heed that you not be deceived. For many will come, how? In my name, saying, I am he, and the time is drawn near, therefore do not go after them. Now, it's a wonderful reminder that inscriptions in Cyprus bearing the name of Sergius Paulus have been found in Cyprus confirming that he was a Christian and that his entire family became Christians as well. That tells us he did not go after Elimus false teaching and prophecies. Now the word sorcerer here is the word magos or magi. It means magician. It can mean wise men or astronomers or even astrologers. And it's clear that Elimus had no interest in losing his meal ticket and source of power in the eyes of the Cypriots coming to saving faith in Jesus. Now, his intentions are stated as such in verse 8. He stood against Saul and Barnabas seeking to turn the proconsul away from the true faith. Now, Peter said this about false prophets and deceivers like Elimus. In 2 Peter 2, 12 and 14, he said, But these, like natural brute beasts made to be caught and destroyed, speak evil of the things they do not understand and will utterly perish in their own corruption and will receive the wages of unrighteousness as those, as those who count it pleasure 
to carouse in the daytime. They are spots and blemishes, carousing in their own deceptions while they feast with you, having eyes full of adultery, and they cannot cease from sin, enticing unstable souls. They have a heart trained in covetous practices and are what? Accursed children. So Saul and Barnabas have the Holy Spirit call them. They confirm the matter with and through the leaders of the church, and they get on a ship, they head to Cyprus. They preach the word of God from one side of the island to the other, which is 90 miles. And they run into, of all things, a wizard or a sorcerer who is openly and aggressively opposing them. Now, this leads to our second consideration about walking in the spirit. Listen this morning. Walking in the spirit will always be met with satanic opposition. Walking in the spirit will always be met with satanic opposition. Now, initially I had written down that it will always be met with spiritual opposition, but I don't think we mention enough or recognize enough, certainly not in the church corporate and global, about the fact that we are at war with the forces of darkness. There is a spiritual battle that we are engaged in. And when we walk in the light, the kingdom of darkness is going to oppose us. Just making sure you're still here. You're awful quiet out there this morning. Now, 2 Corinthians 10, 4 to 6 says, the weapons of our what? Our warfare are not carnal. They're not of the flesh but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. That tells us the flesh can't pull down strongholds. Casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Now, Ephesians six twelve also reminds us we do not wrestle against what? Flesh and blood but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Now, if we have weapons of warfare, doesn't that imply we're at war? Obviously, we are at war. Ephesians makes clear who our adversaries are. They are emissaries of Satan. They are principalities. They are powers. They are rulers of darkness, spiritual hosts of wickedness. Now, as I was going through this section, I couldn't help but think of some of the crazy things that have happened to Terry and I over the years to remind us that we are in a battle. We have often talked about in our home how early on when God was beginning to move me toward the ministry, Terry is walking across the parking lot of a grocery store that had just opened. There was only uh, one or two other cars in the parking lot. There were no people uh, in the parking lot inside. And as she approached the door, suddenly a man behind her appears, if you will, and just starts screaming at her about being a Christian and what a lie it is and just read her the riot act up one side and down the other and she got away from him, got in the store, turned around, there was nobody there. Now, that wasn't late night pizza. That happened after she got the kids ready for school and taken them and dropped them off and all that. One night in our home, we were all simultaneously awakened when our kids were small. And we all met in the hallway, and we all had the same experience. We all felt as though someone was trying to get in the windows of the house, all the windows of the house simultaneously. I called a friend of mine who was a prayer warrior at 2 in the morning, and as soon as he said, and this is back before caller ID, he didn't know who was calling, and I called him, I said his name, he said, what's going on? That's the hair standing up all over my neck. What's happening over there? And there was a spiritual battle. The enemy was trying to infiltrate our home, but he was unsuccessful because the Holy Spirit lived in our home and still does today. Now listen, there are costs associated with walking in the Spirit and sacrificially serving Christ as Saul and Barnabas were. And one of them is facing satanic opposition. Now here's something else we need to recognize this morning. If you never share your faith, you're never going to be thought a fool. If you never stand for righteousness on social issues, you're never going to be called a bigoted hater. 
If you never walk out of a theater because a movie is offensive, no one is ever going to call you a self-righteous Bible thumper or any other derogatory term. If you never practice consistent honesty in business, you're never going to lose a dishonest customer. If you never reach out to the needy, you're never going to be taken advantage of. If you never give your heart, your heart will never be broken. There is a risk to walking in the spirit, a cost, if you will, not a risk, because God is for us. Amen? Amen. Now, never go to Cyprus, and you're never going to be subjected to a rather exciting confrontation with one of Satan's emissaries. Seriously, follow Christ, and you're going to experience a whole array of things that are completely unknown to the unbeliever. But wait, there's more. Look at 9 through 12. Then Saul, who is also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, O oh, full of all deceit and all fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of all unrighteousness, will you not cease perverting the straight ways of the Lord? Paul's next book was called How to Win Friends and Influence People. <laughs> And now indeed the hand of the Lord is upon you and you shall be blind, not seeing the sun for a time. And immediately a dark mist fell on him and he went around seeking someone to lead him by the hand. Then the proconsul believed when he saw what had been done, being astonished at the teaching of the word. Now, it wasn't uncommon in Paul's day to give a child two names. After all, the Jews were living under Roman domination and the Hebrew name of Saul after King Saul was obviously associated with Judaism. Paul was an appropriate name. It was a Roman name for ministering among the Gentiles. Saul means desired. Paul means little. And as the apostle to the Gentiles, we're going to see him named Paul from this point forward. Now we have seen that the Holy Spirit said, then we saw the Holy Spirit sent in conjunction with the sending of the church. And now we see that the Holy Spirit filled. Now, there's nothing in the language that implies that uh, Paul was filled at this point in time, but there's nothing in the language that denies it either. The Spirit certainly could have come upon him for the purpose of this particular encounter. Now, his language is direct. His language is confrontational. And we need to remember that the harshest and most severe words in all of the Bible, both Old and New Testaments, are reserved for those who stand between people coming to the truth, who stand between men and God. Now, we also need to note Paul loved Sergius Paulus, and that was his motivation for speaking in anger to Elimus the sorcerer. It was a heart of love for someone who was seeking after the word of the Lord. Now in Matthew 23, 13 to 15, we're told, woe to you, Jesus speaking, scribes and Pharisees. What was the next word? Hypocrite. Hypocrites. That was his pet name for this group. For you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. For you neither go in yourselves, nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. Hypocrite. Hypocrites. For you devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayers, therefore you will receive greater condemnation. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. hypocrites, for you travel land and sea to win one proselyte, and when he is one, you make him twice as much a son of what? A son of hell as yourselves. This is exactly what Elimus was trying to do. Shut up the kingdom of heaven from Sergius Paulus. And Paul called him out. He said, you are a deceitful fraud. You're a son of the devil, an enemy of righteousness who perverts the straight way of the Lord. And now, Paul says, the hand of the Lord is going to blind your eyes for a time. And immediately it happened and he had to be led around by the hand. Now, why is this important for us to know? Because it showed the people of Paphos that Bar-Jesus was a fraud and the Jesus Paul preached was not. And this opened the door for Paul to teach the word of the Lord. Now, here's the next thing we need to glean, our final point of observation about walking in the spirit. Listen this morning. Walking in the spirit is a life of power and authority 
over the forces of darkness. Walking in the spirit is a life of power and authority over the forces of darkness. Now, Matthew 10, 1 says, and when he, Jesus, had called his 12 disciples to them, to him, he gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all kinds of sicknesses and all kinds, sickness and all kinds of disease. James 4, 7 says, therefore, sub submit to God, resist the devil. And what's the end result? He will flee from you. 1 John 4, 4 says, you are of God, little children, and have overcome them because he who is in you is greater than he who is where? In the world. Now, this is the life of walking in the spirit, a life of power and authority over unclean spirits, the power to resist the devil, causing him to flee because he who is in us is greater than he who is after us. A very loose paraphrase. Terry and I, when we were back in Cincinnati in May, my longtime friend, uh, Pastor Rick Schutte, the pastor of the church back there who invited us back to do the uh, prophecy conference, we were talking about a time neither one of us will ever forget, a time that happened, uh, has to be 30 years ago, where he and I and a couple of other uh, elders at the church were called to the children's ministry because there was something going on there that needed attention. So we encountered a four-year-old boy who was howling and hissing and barking and biting his mom and spitting at her and come to find out his mom was a new Christian who had been long involved in hallucinogenic drugs and witchcraft before she got saved and her son was possessed Listen, it took four men to hold down a four-year-old boy. Each one of us had to be on one of his appendages. It took all four of us to hold this little boy down. And we prayed over him and prayed over him and anointed him with oil. And the unclean spirit was driven out of him. And he returned in front of our eyes to being a four-year-old boy who loved and adored his mommy. The war against satanic forces is real, and we are involved in it. Elimus was of his father, the devil, and Paul, walking in the spirit, shut him down, interestingly, the same way the Lord shut Saul down with blindness. Now, this wasn't an isolated incident that Paul walked in power and authority. In Acts chapter 16, when we get there in 2019, We'll find in 16 to 19 of that chapter that it happened as we went to prayer. A certain slave girl possessed with the spirit of divination met us who brought her masters much profit by fortune telling. This girl followed Paul and us and cried out saying, these men are servants of the most high God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. Now, was that not true? Yeah, remember 2 Corinthians 11 says the devil and his angels and his earthly vessels masquerade as ministers of light. So they're not afraid to tell the truth, but they always tamper with it as well. These men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim the, to us the way of salvation. And this she did for many days. But Paul, what are the next two words? Greatly annoyed, turned and said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out that very hour. But when her master saw that their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to the authorities. Now, we'll cover all the things that happened after that when we arrive there. But let me just say this, and here's one of the reasons I wanted to incorporate that particular scene. We need to get annoyed with the devil's antics. We need to get annoyed with the devil's antics instead of tolerating them or even participating in them. We need to be annoyed with them. So here's the question. Are we walking in the spirit? 
Well, we know that's not some kind of rogue, independent separation from the church corporate and the accountability we have to others through that. We know that walking in the Spirit is going to be met with satanic opposition. We know that walking in the Spirit is a life of power and authority over the forces of darkness. So why settle for anything less? That sounds like an awesome life, doesn't it? (laughs) Were you thinking that was a trick question or something? Now, one last thing from verse 12. Then the proconsul believed when he saw what had been done, being astonished at what? At the teaching of the Lord. Listen, it wasn't just seeing something miraculous like striking Elimus with blindness that astonished him. It was the teaching of the word of God. This is why we have power and authority over the forces of darkness to advance the kingdom of God for his glory and the rescue of lost souls. So that tells us that when we seek, as Paul admonished us to do, in or out of season, to preach the word, that we're going to be walking in the spirit when we do, and the word of the Lord will grow mightily and prevail, even as it did in the life, heart, and family of the Roman governor, Sergius Paulus. So, yes, Let's walk in the spirit that we might not fulfill the lust of the flesh. But let's walk in the spirit that we might live a life of authority and power in this ever darkening age. Yes, it will keep us safe, but yes, it will make us strong. Let's walk in the spirit of God with a greater understanding from this day forward. And that's where you say... And Father, again, we are grateful for our time together this morning. We thank you uh, for the words of life that we have found today uh, through this rather interesting scene. And Lord, much like we see peppered throughout the whole of Scripture, those who seek to do something for your glory and great name, they're going to face opposition. Ezra faced opposition. Nehemiah faced opposition. Moses faced opposition. And sometimes that opposition comes from close by. But the fact of the matter is, Lord, we recognize this and it should not hinder us from continuing to walk in your spirit. We thank you for reminding us that you who are greater, or you who are in us, are greater than he who is in the world. And therefore, Lord, we can pull down strongholds. We can cast down every argument and high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. So Lord, I pray if we take anything away from today, it's to stop putting up with what the devil's trying to do to us and start walking in power and authority by your spirit granted to us the moment we became yours and we're saved. We thank you, God, for the truths we have encountered today. Help us to take them with us and live according to them from this day forward, now knowing what walking in the spirit is not and all that it is, at least as much as we could cover this morning. So we thank you, God, for our time and text today. We pray these things in Jesus' name and all the saints agreed by saying, Amen. Amen. Listen, I think this is a critical time for us to just kind of land in this scripture as we see everything going on in our country and certainly around the world. We know that persecution of the saints is nothing new. The church has been persecuted since the very beginning. The church began getting persecuted, at least by questioning, on Pentecost, and it's only gotten worse since then. But things are changing here in our country. Things are different here in the United States of America, which was founded on the biblical principles and doctrines that we hold dear as the church. There's a different climate today. Christians are being arrested. Christians are losing their business because they take a moral stand on what God has defined to be right in his eyes, not the right of human courts and laws of the land. And there comes a time where we have to take a stand as Peter and the others did when they said we ought to obey God rather than man. And we're being pushed into that particular season, I do believe. I don't know how long that season is going to last or how great the persecution will become here in the United States of America. But the fact is, it's already begun. It's already happening. 
AB 2943, which is uh, not allowing any company to promote or sell literature or practice treating gender dysphoria. When the fact is, anybody can understand, as has been understood for the course of human history, there are not 63 genders. There are two genders, you as a boy or you as a girl, and there is no other choice. And yet, we're treated like there's something wrong with us for believing that. So friends, listen, we need to toughen up. We need to walk in the spirit more than anything else. And yes, we'll have the wonderful benefit of not fulfilling the lust of the flesh and thus being disqualified or sidelined from the ministry. But the fact is, we will walk in authority and power in an ever darkening age. And we have to have that today. Somebody say, would you all stand?